How's this? Perfect. It's perfect, Charlie. Thank you. Well, it's not so long on the grassy spots up here, but oh, say the breeze. Oh, on a clear day, you can see all the way over to 8th Avenue. Only don't be blabbing to the other women folk in the building. I'll have the works of them up here using my roof like a general sun in massage parlor. I won't breathe a word to anyone, I promise. And what's this? Parsley. Parsley? I'm from the country. And in the country this time of year, when you wash your hair and you're drying it in the backyard, you get the most wonderful scent of green and growing things. Not just flowers, you know, but new things coming up in the vegetable garden. And, well, this parsley happens to be the only really garden thing I have, so I thought I'd bring it with me mm, and sniff it once in a while and pretend it's the country right here on the roof. You women, you're nothing but little girls in long skirts with your hair done up. I know it. If you go up high enough, the, the sun shines almost like it is in the country, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I shouldn't wonder, though. I think Calvary Cemetery is about as close as I'm ever going to get to the country. So now here, you can set yourself on this old soapbox, dangling your feet a bit. The old janitor, the last one, his wife, I think she used to do her laundry up here or something. And I'm going to leave the door unlocked, you see? You're so kind. Oh, can you blame me? I didn't. Do you think 
I'd choose this one spot in all of New York to dry my hair. Well, when I said flip your I didn't mean just that. I meant, who are you? Why are you here? Where do you come from? And do you sign your own name to your stuff, or do you use a nom de plume? What? How did you know I was a writer? Give me five minutes more. I'll tell you to make of your typewriter and where your last rejection slip came from. Oh, then you are the scrub lady stalwart son, and you've been ransacking my wastebasket. See, you thought you could write, so you came to New York. One doesn't just travel to New York, as in New York, you know, or move to it. One comes to New York. And now you're here, and things aren't going quite as planned. You haven't sold a single story yet, your cover's getting bare, and you're not so sure about the writing anymore. Am I warm? Maybe. Maybe. Or, yes, that's exactly right. You must be psychic. All right, yes. I don't know how you can see all that, but yes, it's true. What's the problem? With your writing, why hasn't it sold? You can't see that in your little crystal ball? My powers are limited. I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. I tried writing about New York, you know? My experience is here. Then I tried writing a love story, but that isn't working out either. My hero looks more like a clothing store dummy than a real life human being. And from what I hear, editors are too fond of black mustachioed figures nowadays. I've been arguing with him for a week and how the stubborn mule, and he won't make love to my heroine. I've tried putting red blood in his veins, but the two of them just won't get together. They're as far apart as the day I sat down to write. I'm at my wit's end. I've bitten off nearly half of my fingernails. Look, see? Maybe it's your heroine. Maybe she just doesn't inspire me. No, there is nothing wrong with my heroine. I assure you of that. She is a fascinating, mysterious creature, full of passion and wit and adventure. But not once has he clasped her to him fiercely or pressed his lips to her hair, her eyes, her cheek. He hasn't even had the guts to devour her with his gaze, as we writers like to say. morning, he was showing signs of life. He was developing possibilities, but nothing came of it. He whipped out. That's why I washed my hair and came out here, to forget about him for a little while. What did you do back home? Back home? <laughs> I taught school and hated it. But I kept on teaching until I had saved $500. All the other girls teach until they've saved $500, and they pack their two suitcases and head to Europe for the summer. But I saved my $500 for New York. I've been here six months now, and the $500 has shrunk to almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And if I don't break into the magazine soon, then, then I go back to teaching 27 young devils that six times eight is 48. Drop the nod and carry the six that a rhetorical question requires no answer and that the French are a gay people fond of dancing and light wines. But I'll scrimp on everything from hairpins to shoes and back again until I've saved another $500 and I'll do it all over again because I can write. I didn't ask for permission because I could see you weren't the kind of fool that objects. No, go ahead. No one of the editors? No, that. No, that. <laughs> if camping out on doorsteps and haunting office buildings and cajoling and fighting with secretaries, office boys, and assistants constitutes knowing them, then sure. We're chums. What kind of feedback have you gotten? Feedback? <laughs> Nothing. None. It's not what we're looking for. 
After careful consideration, we've decided not to accept your submission at this time. Bosco! And if these literary experts think so little of your writing, what makes you think you can write? Oh, well, being the scrub lady's stalwart son, you wouldn't understand. But I can write. How dare you come up here acting all high and mighty like you've got me figured out in two minutes. I don't care what you think. I won't go under. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make this town count me in as the four million and one. Sometimes I get so tired of being no one at all without even the cleverness to rest living from this city that I just want to stand out on the edge of the curb and scream, wave my hat about and shout, I am Mary Louise Moss from Escanaba, Michigan, and I like your town, and I want to stay here. Won't somebody please notice me? Just a little bit. No one even knows I'm here, except for me and the rent collector. And me. Oh, you? <laughs> you don't care. You never can tell my money. Look here, Mary Louise Moss from Escanaba, Michigan. Stop writing the slop that you're writing. Stop. Drop the silly love stories that are just like the stuff everybody else in this town writes. Stop trying to write about New York. You don't know anything about it. Listen, you get back to work and you write about Mrs. Next Door and the hair wash, the backyard and the vegetable garden, the bees. Understand? You write the way you talk to me. And then send your stuff into Cecil Reeves. Reeves. Cecil Reeves of the earth. You're kidding, right? He wouldn't dream of looking at my stuff. And anyways, it isn't really any of your business, is it? Well, you know, you brought me up here, kicking me your heels and singing at the top of your lungs. I couldn't work.
that view. Oh, you haven't changed a bit. Oh, I would have recognized you anywhere. This is a very important moment, but there's no reason we should have it in the hall. So, let me take your coat. Yeah, I feel like a racehorse. <laughs> you ever go to the track? Well, that's what I feel like. If I was still drinking, I'd offer you a drink. And if I was still drinking, you probably wouldn't be here. But that's all right. That's all right. Ernie. You're not going to call me dad? Or like that? Oh, thank God. So, uh, here we are. Yes. So, uh, how you been? Fine. And you? Uh, great. Well, since the last time you saw me, uh, mainly bad, but lately good, <laughs> you look wonderful. Oh, well, you don't look so bad yourself for an old man. <laughs> you take good care of yourself. Well, I better. Who else is going to take care of me? Well, the VA, of course. Well, they take pretty good care of me, I'm forced to admit. I still go to see them about three times a year for my back. And uh, they take pretty good care of you in the hospital. The guys at the VA, at the AA, well, they don't. I don't see much of them anymore. Thank God. They took pretty good care of me. I hated the son of a bitches. And Frank, over at the place, he took good care of me, too for a while. Five here, ten there. He gave me a job. You know, it's a restaurant business like the back of his hand. Been a very lucky guy. Well, you've got a lot of friends, Bernie. Yeah, I always have, for some reason. <laughs> you take pretty good care of yourself? Got to. Yeah. You know, the AA are the ones who put us in touch with you. Jerry went. He said they seemed like very nice people. They're very contrite. You still go to church? No. Nobody goes to church anymore. You still go to church? No. I never went to church. <laughs> since I was a kid. Easter. Well, we should both go. Renew our faith. Jerry goes to church. Does he mean it? Who knows? You never know. He might mean it. But some of them mean it. God damn it, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. This apartment is very nice for me. Well, I, I did it myself. Well, uh, Leslie, my friend, she helped quite a lot, actually, to put the place, the state it's in now, but the basic place. I furnished it, fixed it up. I've been here two years plus. I'm glad you like it. Well, you'll like our place a lot when you come see it. It's very nice. I did it myself. It's a real home, you know? It's just five rooms. It does get a little cramped when the kids are there. Jerry's kids. They have to sleep in the living room. But Jerry has a study. We're very comfortable there. You got a doorman? Oh, yes. The building's very safe. Lots of light and air. We're thinking about building a house. This apartment really is lovely, Bernie. What can I tell you? Are you in there? That was a long time ago. I'm going to pick you out. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I haven't changed, huh? Bernie Carey, Army Air Corps. Yeah, Butch. They called me Butch then. <laughs> Why? I couldn't tell you to save my life. Those were strange times. What's this? It's a medal. Uh, sit down. Sit down. It's nothing. It's nothing. I fought. I did my bit. If you want to know about your father, I shot a machine gun. Big deal. They had a life expectancy of, you know, three missions. Three. What the hell? You can get killed in a steel mill, right? But I'm no hero. 
They put you in a plane with a gun. It pays to shoot at the guys who are trying to kill you. Where's the courage in that? But you didn't take anything from anybody. Nobody. And that was all right. Anybody get wise? Some wise-ass lieutenant. I say shove it, champ. I'm a fucking tail gunner on a B-17. I don't take no shit. <laughs> from some chicken lieutenant? <laughs> And I didn't either, from anybody. So, what's that make me? You would like England. Oh, I've been there. You have? What, with your new husband? Oh, with him, and by myself. Uh, where else you been? Uh, Jamaica, around the States. Yeah, you see America first, right? I worked a year in San Francisco, in a body shop. I've been to San Francisco. Yeah, a lot of fine people in San Francisco. A lot of assholes, too. <laughs> There's a lot of assholes all over. Ah, people. People are people, you know? So, tell me about your new husband. I want to know about you. And I want to know about you. Does he love you? I swear, tell me the truth. I swear I'll kill the son of a bitch. So tell me the truth. Yes, he loves me. And you love him? Yes. So where's the story in that? There's no story. It's just the usual. It's not the usual for nothing. Mm -hmm. These things work out. Yeah, they, they work themselves out. Is, is he a good guy? He's a... He's a good guy. I think he's frightened of women. He's frightened of you. <laughs> That's funny, but you know, never having been a man, you don't know, but a lot of men are frightened of women. Let me tell you, beautiful women especially can be very frightening. Yeah, there's no shame in that. He takes good care of you. Yes. Well, what do you want? I want to hear about you. Well, what's to tell? Yeah, have a look. This is what you see. 53 years old. Ex-alcoholic, ex-this, ex-that. Democrat. You smoke pot? No. Do you? No. I tried it once. I don't like the taste. I saw no reason to change my style of life simply because I happen to be an alcoholic. Taste. I never bumped for change. Waste of time. Bill, two bills, bounce a check. Respectable. If you're a drunk, you better be respectable. 1951, I lost my license. 14 citations for drunk driving in the month of December, 1951. <laughs> you were what, four? I was out on the Cape. You and your mother were living in Newton. What were you doing? 1951, I was in the vet's hospital for a while with my back, and the rest of the time, I was working for the phone company, worked 10 years for the phone company, seen a girl in Boston. Uh, you and your mother were split. Your mother and I were split. Uh, I got that court honor in 1951, you know. Did you know I wanted to see you? Did they tell you anything? I wanted to come see you, but I couldn't see you because of that court order. I don't know. Hmm. They told me something. I was a mover for a year, cross country. I missed my brother's funeral. Your Uncle Alex, uh, you never met. Did you meet yes. Alex? Yeah. He's dead now. 1962, and his wife Lorraine won't talk to me because she thinks that I missed, because I missed his funeral. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I missed it too, but what the hell, life goes on. And when he died, I was out west someplace with American van lines. I didn't even find out about it until September. You want to hear a story? I sure do. I'll tell you a story. So, 
I'd been drunk for several years now, and I was walking down Tremont Street one evening around 9 p.m., and here's this big van parked in front of a warehouse. And the driver is in the shipping dock ringing the bell trying to get in, which he won't do, of course, because they moved a couple of weeks ago. But he doesn't know that. And the warehouse is deserted. So I say, hey, you, you uh, looking for Hub City Transport? And he says, yeah. I say, well, they moved. He says, where? I say, over to Leechmere. He says, where? I say, I don't know the address. I can take you there, which, of course, was a bunch of shit. But I figured maybe I can make a few bucks on the deal. And why not? So we ride over to Leechmere. I find the warehouse. You ever been to Leachman? No. It's very depressing. <laughs> so anyway, he's in Leachman to pick up a load. So he offers me 10 bucks to help him load the van. So, fine. Later we go across the street for a cup of coffee, and here he gives me this story about how he just fired his pot, he likes the way I handle furniture. Do I want a job? <laughs> well, what the hell? Why not? So. We finish the coffee and off we go. And for one year, I never returned home. I never shaved. Wore the same goddamn clothes, slept in the cab, made some money, spent some money, saw the country. Alex died. I missed his funeral. Which, of course, is why Lorraine won't talk to me. Because I'm back a day or two in September. I go over to Alex's. I knock on the door. Lorraine answers. I say, Lorraine! Tell your fat ass husband to grab his coat, because we're going to the track. He loved the track. And she says, if I ever catch you in my sight, drunk or sober again, I'm going to rip your fucking heart out. Which, harsh words for her. <laughs> to this day, she believes I was in town and drunk at the time of the funeral. Oh. Not once in 10 years have I seen or spoken to her. In 10 years, and we were very close at one time. She was a good woman, very loyal, Alex. Fought in the war. What the hell? How's your mother? Good. And the guy that she married? Good. He's a hell of a man, you know. No, I don't doubt it. I never met the son of a bitch, but I'd stake my life on it. You got any kids? No. I didn't think so. How long you been married? Two years. Jerry's got kids. You told me. Uh, how old? Twelve and eight. Boys. How are they? Good boys. You like them? They get along. They like you? You know how it is. Yeah, other mother died? Divorce. I like them. Jerry. Oh. He seems like an all right guy. A thoughtful guy, but Jesus, he gave me a moment, though, when I come in the restaurant and Frank, Frank's the owner, he says, uh, Bernie, there's a guy outside uh, asking for Butch Carey. Now, I haven't called myself Butch since I'm on the wagon, three years. I was called Butch from the days in the air corps and all my drunk partners, they all know me as Butch. So I figure it's some old acquaintance uh, looking for a handout or a bill collector because he called me Butch. So I peek out of the kitchen door, and there's this real nice-looking guy. He's around 40. Uh, well, I'm telling you what he looks like. <laughs> so anyway, it's obvious he's not a bill collector, and he's not looking for a handout. I don't know him from Adam. So I walk out of the kitchen. He, he must have told you this stuff. So I walk out of the kitchen. I still got my coat on because I just come in the back door. And I walk over to him. And he says, are you Butch Carey? And I say, yeah, who are you? And he says, he's Jerry Mingler, Carol's husband, your daughter. I told him I know who my daughter is. I told him, mister, I'm one dumb son of a bitch. But I'll be goddamned if I don't feel like I'm going to bust out crying. I almost did.
you got a brother you never met. A half-brother. Mine. My, my and Ruth's kid. Ruth. My, my second wife. I, I guess you could call her your, your stepmother if it made any sense. I, I know your, your, your mother had another daughter. Barbara. I know. We're very close. Well, I don't doubt it. We are. Marty, you, you'd like him? How is he? Uh, I haven't seen him now in several years. Let's say he's three years younger than you. He's a good kid. What does he do? Do? Oh, uh, last time I heard nothing. <laughs> this might have changed. What was Ruth like? Ruth is like your mother, sorry to say. Not that she wasn't a lovely woman, and not that your mother was not a lovely woman, but we didn't get along too long. And your mother was no hot shot either when you come down, but well, Ruth never understood me. I take it back. Ruth understood me. When Marty was young, we got along. And then? And I left her. These things happened. Jesus, he was a fine, he was a fine little kid. <laughs> Having kids, Carol, is something that no one can describe. Having your own kids, it's indescribable. I mean it. You were quite a little kid. We used to have a good time going to the zoo. You remember that? You remember what you used to say when you would come home? I would come home, three years old, I'd come in the door and you would say, hi there. Oh, <laughs> but where'd you pick that up? I guess your mother used to coach you. Do you remember that? Do you remember going to the Museum of Science? To see the locomotives? The steam engines? <laughs> yeah, you were a beautiful kid. <laughs> You meant everything to your mother and me. I still got the pictures. Do you know who took those? Do you want to see how cute you were? Just sit there. Sit there. You know who took those? Alex took those at his new house. The 4th of July, 1950, was the first year he was in his new house. No, you probably don't remember. He took them with his brownie. You were crying for some reason. And I said, look at the camera, baby. Oh, be goddamn. I don't know where those pictures are. It's OK. They, they got to be around here somewhere. But where? Where are they? It's OK, Mark. But I look at them constantly. You want some coffee? Smoke too much? I know. Does your husband smoke? Yes. Does he tell you to cut down? Yes. They're no good for you. I know. He should set an example. He's my husband, Bernie. He's not my father. I don't smoke. I gave it up when I went on the wagon for three years. Did I tell you? I'm thinking about getting married. <laughs> well, it, it, no. it, it, it's not definite. Not yet. I'm just thinking. <laughs> Leslie, she works at the restaurant. Jerry met her. Tell me about her. Uh, she knows me. I know her. She's a good worker. I respect her. She knows my past. I, I think she loves me. She's around 40. You know, she was married once. It's like a habit. Would, would that do anything to you? Yeah, you know? I mean, I realize my getting married, you don't have a long basis for comparison, but would it do anything? I think it would be good for you. You think that? Yes. 
us. It wouldn't get in the way of us getting to know each other. Why are you getting married again? Companionship. But I'm a happy man now. And I don't use the term loosely. I got a good job. I stopped drinking. I'm putting away a little money. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. For the first time in a long time, I get a kick out of what I'm doing at work. They respect me. Everybody knows me. I spend a lot of time walking. Just walking. Out on the common. After all this time, not to catch a drink or to get laid. Excuse me. People all the time, always talking about it. Going out to the country, getting back to nature. Oh, I say, yeah, yeah. Well, what does it mean? I mean, I see the logic of it, but it means nothing to me because my entire life, I'm looking for a way around. You know what I mean? So drinking, certainly, or with your mother, or my second wife being in debt. Oh, there was never a reason. All the money troubles. Changing jobs all the time. What does it get me but dumber and dumber? And I'm a cynic. But now, on the other hand, I mean, I'm 53 years old. I spent the majority of my life drinking and being, when you get down to it, a hateful son of a bitch. But now you, you're married. You live it well. You live well. You got a fine guy. Nice guy for a husband, gonna make you have kids. You shouldn't let it bother you. But you have a lot of possibilities. Don't you feel that way? I do. But then the rest of the stuff is not important. It's for the weaklings. No, and I like people as much as the next guy, but it's for the sissies and the drinkers, of which I was once. Otherwise, what have you got to lose? Take a chance. You got to take a chance at, ha at your happiness. You got to grab it. You got to know it. You got to want it. You got to take it, because all the possessions in the world can't take it for you. You want to drink? Do you understand what I'm talking about? It's a fucking jungle out there, and you got to learn the rules because nobody's going to teach the rules to you. If you want to drink, go drink. You want to do this, pay the price. Always. The price. Whatever it is. You got to know it, and you got to be prepared to pay it if you don't want it to pass you by. And if you don't know that, you got to find it out. Yeah. Well, that's all I know. 1950, 1970. I don't care. You know what I mean? What's on my mind now is getting to know you and maybe getting married again. You look good. Jesus. You're know, one good-looking young woman. I get it all from you. Uh, you know, I used to think you were the handsomest man I ever saw. You used to look just like Tonto. <laughs> Tonto? Yeah, the Indian, the Lone Ranger's friend. I know who Tonto is. It was my secret. I swore you were Tonto. I even asked you once, do you remember? No. Oh, I, you said, no, of course not. <laughs> I was very upset. I didn't know why you were lying to me. Oh, I'm sorry. I was about four. I never told anyone. I thought it was our secret. I thought you wanted me to keep our secret. Thank you. Bernie. What? Bernie, you're wasted in the restaurant. Do you know that? Oh, I like it at a restaurant. <laughs> I, I, I love it at a restaurant. I, I work at the restaurant. 
Leslie works at the restaurant. What do you mean? I just mean, I, well, I mean, who do you, who, <coughs> I mean, who do you think you're talking to? It's not Tonto the Indian. This is Bernie Carey, ex-drunk. The only two worthwhile things I ever did in my life was fire a machine gun and work for the phone company, and I can't do either of them anymore. And I don't want you to feel sorry for me, but I'm just telling you that I mean I am what I am. And that's what happiness comes from, being just that. Don't you agree? I mean, you must remember, your mother was a different sort of person from me, as is, I'm sure, the guy that she married. And the way that you're brought up, although very well and good, is basically, it's not my life, but as fine as it might be. I hope it brings you a lot of happiness. I mean, you haven't even been to the restaurant, for Christ's sake. Very clean. That's not what I meant. I just I meant I know what you meant. Look, I know what you're talking about. My life needn't be your life. Any sense of the word? I like it like I am. And if the people that you go with, your friends and so on, silly, they feel Bernie. that I'm silly. I'm not being silly. Oh, yes, you are. That's the last I want to say about it. Okay, but so I... So for Christ's sakes, just knock it off, okay? I gotta admit it. I knew you were coming over here. I was scared. Yes, me too. Yeah, there's nothing wrong in that. No. I mean, what were we going to expect? Red sails in the sunset? <laughs> so. So what do you do now? I mean... Oh, I work for Jerry at the office. A secretary? I'm just sort of everything. It sounds great. It's actually got a lot of responsibility. Yeah, well, as long as you like it. Right. right. I'm so quit. Right. I mean, anyway, it's not the end of the world. We're not sleeping together much anymore. Huh. Oh. That's only part of it. Come on. Come on. Let me tell you something. You know what my advice to you is? What? Don't let it get you down. He's not such a great lover, anyway. He seems like a nice enough guy. He's a lousy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean he's not a nice guy. You know about it. Well, I was speaking as your father, and as a guy with quite an experience what in the work. <laughs> Not a hell of a lot, but I can tell you this. He's genuinely fond of you. That's got to count for something. Right? You know, when I was young, people used to talk about broken homes. Today, nothing. Everyone's divorced. Every kid on the block has got three sets of parents. But I mean, it must have affected my marriage. I came from a broken home. The finest, most important institution in America. Life goes on. Carol, I'm yeah, sure life goes on. The... Yeah, no matter how much of an asshole you may be or may have been, life goes on. Jerry's life. I'm not going to lie to you. I felt guilt, remorse, every other goddamn thing. Oh, I missed you. What the hell? I, I, I was mad. I was mad at your mother. I was mad at you. I was mad at the fucking government for never treating me anything like it, but like a kid. Saving their asses with daylight precision bombing. Not everybody. Hates the VA. <laughs> understand, Carol. I'm not asking you to understand me. We've both been through enough. 
Am I right? Jerry is in Korea. Yes. And? Well, what does he say about it? Nothing. I'll tell you a story. This was strange. When I was working for the phone company out on the Cape, a lineman making repairs out on the street, making out okay. What with that and my disability, I bought myself a new Buick. Beautiful, mm, son of a bitch. We used to drive into Boston and go out to Wonderland with Alex. He loved that car. I think he was secretly envious. So anyway, it's December 30th, and I'm out on the Cape, and I'm working, and then I get invited to a New Year's Eve party out in Provincetown. So I'm supposed to be working. So I call in sick. What the hell, I had a good work record. So it's New Year's Eve day, and I'm getting ready to drive out to Provincetown. I put 100 bucks in my wallet. I go to Mitchell's, that's a tavern in Falmouth I used to hang out at. There's this Italian kid. Shooting pool, uh, about 20 something, uh, Stevie, something like that. So I offered him 20 bucks to drive out to Provincetown with me, stay in the car, and drive me home the next day, New Year's. So, fine. Later, we drive out to Provincetown. We get to Kenny Hill's house. Kenny Hill, you, I think, would have liked him, I think. I know he would have liked you. He had an eye for the younger women. Who could blame him, right? So, we had a hell of a party. Kenny Hill knows how to throw a party. It's the one thing that he knows how to do. So, the point is not the party, but the morning after. So, the morning after, I get up from the couch or wherever I was, and I put on my coat, and I go outside, and I invite this kid Steve in for a cup of coffee. There's the view, but the kid is gone. Nowhere to be found. He vanished along with my flashlight, which I don't find out about until I rack the car up near Truro. Mm -hmm. But hold on, hold on. I think he took my flashlight. So I go back into the house, pull myself together. I figure I better start back to found. I'm hung over as a son of a bitch. I grab the bottles. And off into the car. I say goodbye to my friends and off into the car. It's snowing up a storm. I'm weaving all over the road. I can hardly see anyway. And the next thing I know, I'm asleep. And the following thing, I'm wrapped around the telephone pole. I knock the pole clean over the hood of the Buick and wrench to shit. So I go in the back to get the flashlight to maybe get a peek at the engine. The flashlight is gone. There's no help for it. So I get back in the car. I go to sleep. Next thing I know, here comes a black and white. Now the cop wakes me up. I happen to know him from around foul. And I convince him that it's all an accident. I give him a drink. He drives me home and promises to call the garage. So you should be very careful about who you're calling the pig. In it. I'm no sooner in bed. Ten seconds later, wham, the phone rings. It's Jim Dottie, supervisor for the cake. How you feeling, he asks. Like a big piece of cow shit, I tell him. You gotta come in today. Jim, I tell him. It's New Year's. I'm sick. Get someone else. Everyone else is drunk. <laughs> I'm the only one here. And some asshole knocked over a pole. Not true. <laughs> so I tell him, Jim, my car won't stop. He says he's coming over in the truck to get me. So I put on, make some coffee. He comes, we go over to Truro to fix the pole. He's cussing the whole way over. Jag off this asshole lap. What with the overtime pay and the holiday pay and the 20 bucks that Jim slipped for coming along, I made nearly $90 in one afternoon. <laughs> Jim was so mad, he did most of the work himself, and I spent most of the time in the cab drinking. But,
can't work for the phone company anymore. And they finally pulled my license. That was it. I hit a cop car. <laughs> Actually, it sounds a lot more exciting than it actually was, because it was an unmarked car, and it was parked anyway. The only time I ever get a ticket in Boston, it's a heartbreaker. Yeah, they took my license. They fired me, and they met it. Jim Darty, he went down to Boston to talk to them for me. He even wrote a letter to the Board of Trustees for me. <coughs> The board of trustees of the phone company, no good. He said that he would quit if I got fired. But he didn't know. But he would have. It broke him up, too. He was the best goddamn lineman on the Cape. Best record. Eight years. We were very close. Can. Just like that. Pension, benefits, seniority, shot. I suppose it was for the best, but I'll be goddamned if I could see how. I used to drink a bit on the job. Everybody did. Jim knew that. Nobody cared. If I hadn't showed up in that accident report, I'd be working today. Ah, uh, what the hell? How long do you think you can get your license back again? Supposedly, never. But actually, in about a year. Yeah, they review it. The guys at the AA, they told me about it. They go up there with you, their opinion. Very respected. I was a teacher for a while. You what? In Where? In Newton. I taught the sixth grade. <laughs> How about that? Where? At the Horace Mann School. You were at the Horace Mann School? Well, for a year and a half. I was right across the street. Where? At the garage. The company garage is right across the street. I used to be out there all the time. We used to go on the mics. Do you ever eat in there? No, I mean, I went in once or twice for a cigarette. I used to be in there all the time. Easily twice a week. For years, God damn. When were you there? 1969. I stopped working for the phone company in 55. You want some tea? Do you have any coffee? Uh, sure. Uh, instant? That's fine. Okay. But I bet I saw you around Boston. Huh? Boston Street? We must have seen each other on the common a hundred times. I remember the day that you turned 21, February 4th, 1968. It's your birthday. I was going to call you. You probably don't believe that. But that's, that's all right. It, it's not important. Actions are important. The present is important. I was uh, in jail once for a couple of days. And what it taught me, you got to be where you are while you are there. Or you're nowhere. You know what I mean? As it pertains to you and me. Because I think it's very important. Does this make any sense to you? I want to get to know you. And I want to get to know you. But it's not going to magically wipe out 20 years in which you were growing up, which you would have had to do anyway. And I was drunk. I don't want to get stupid about it. Let's get up and go out and do this. Let's go look for the, uh, see if they still got the locomotive there. Because, all kidding aside, what's between us? going anywhere. And the rest of it doesn't exist. So, uh, let me ask you something. 
You don't mind if I get personal for a second, do you? What I want to know is why all of a sudden you come looking for me. Not that I'm criticizing you, but... Why should I think you're criticizing me? But I could have come looking for you after you turned 21. I mean, not that I would be sure how you would feel about seeing me, but you must have felt the same way, no? I mean, I'm guessing it must have been some sort of a decision on your part to all of a sudden come looking for me. How'd you find me? AA. And you just kind of decided to send Jerry over to meet me? Yes. Why now? I felt lonely. He's my father. I feel lonely. Who doesn't? Sometimes. You know, I felt cheated. Carol. You know, because I never had a father. So I don't want to be pals or buddies, okay? I want you to be my father. I want to hear your goddamn war stories and the whole thing, and that's why now. Because that's how I feel. I'm entitled to it. Am I? Am I? Yes. I am. You're goddamn right I am. You know what's the important thing, Carol? What? Is to be together. What's in the past is in the past. It's gone. It's not coming back. You're a grown woman. I'm on the wagon. Your mother's remarried. I got a good job. There's no reason. I can't make it up to you. Going to work tonight? I don't work on Sundays. But Sandy got sick, so I had to come in. But I called Frank, and he told me that he'd get someone else to cover. So no, I don't have to go in. Just want to do something? Well, Jerry was. He said he'd like it if we went out to dinner. Would you like that? Yeah, I'd like that. Well, we could go just the two of us. No. No, I think it's a good idea. In, in any case, it's, it, it's no big thing, right? We could go out. Just the two of us, together. Whatever you want, Carol. What you want, that's what we'll do. Sit down. I, I got you something. Oh, what? Well, what is it? I don't know. I uh, found it on the bus. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. To Carol from her father. March 8th, <laughs> 1973. Yeah, it's my fault. It's not their fault, but my threes, they look like eights. <laughs> It's only five days off. So thought that counts. You know, Ruth told me never give anyone jewelry because then they'll always think that they have to wear it whenever you're around. So I never gave her any. Real gold. Thank you, Bernie. I'm not going to tell you that you have to wear it if you don't like it. But I hope you do like it. I do like it. So, how's the weather like? Oh, it's fine. It's a little chilly. Shouldn't we be going? Shouldn't you call Jerry? Yes. Okay, you. You do that, I'll put away the things, and then we'll go. The bracelet is lovely, Bernie.
watch it, I said. A little elbow room, huh? There's plenty of it here. You watch it. I was here first. No, you weren't. Nothing was here first. Oh, you heard something? Nothing is coming? How could nothing be coming? That would make it something. Well, this is less than nothing. This is, this is colder than a, than a, this looks darker than a, than a, <laughs> than a, it could be worse though. Really? How? Oh. If it were one degree colder, minus 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit, we couldn't move at all. Ooh, only minus 458.67 degrees. Yes. Whew. I must have missed the billboard. Welcome to Chihuahua City. <laughs> <laughs> What's a billboard? I have no idea. My boy. No idea where that came from. Well, you don't think it's that thing, do you? What thing? That evolution thing? Chihuahua City is evolution. <laughs> well, you said something that we both never heard of before, and, and we're out here in the, in the darker than a... And what you said came from somewhere. How, if not that you're evolving? Me? <laughs> never. Uh, trying to make something of me. I'm proud to be an electron. Oh, I thought I felt some negativity. <laughs> <laughs> felt? Yes, feeling. Ow. Felt. 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 <laughs> what are you doing? None of your business. Oh, you're awful sensitive. Awful? Sensitive? Yes. Two more feelings. Two more? How many are there? Oh, I see. You don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you think feelings are good? I mean, if they exist. I feel they are good. <laughs> How handy. Like you have a handle on anything, you with your one electron. That's not all there is to me. I see no bosons, no muons, and no fermions. I mean it. There's more to me. Yeah, sure. There's something deep down. A feeling. You have a feeling. Boy, no. I just know there's something bigger in me. Hmm. You are dumber than than a, than a... No point of reference, right? And you think you're hot stuff. <laughs> dumber than dumber? Yeah, well, Boyd knows. I got spin. Spin <laughs> is potential. It's a propensity that I've got to... One day, I've got to... I don't know. I've got to... What are you got sperm spin. About? I think I become sperm. Somewhere, somehow, down the dark. Whatever. Do you have the time? <laughs> you know, you know I, I think there's something in me, too. A few of us positrons were talking and... Positron? <laughs> of course, of course. What? Positron? You might as well have said yacker. <laughs> yacker. Anyway. No, I think there's something in me, too. Oh, sure. Jealousy. Latch on to my gimmick. No, no, no. Hold on. Let me finish. Yak away. Kill some time. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> I was just saying, I don't think I'm no dimensional. Of course you are. Nothing hasn't even happened, so how could there be depth, width, length? I know. I know. I don't but... think you do. I don't think you grasp the abjectly, hopelessly, <laughs> empty. It's not even a singularity. Well, I'm something. For Boyd's sake, I'm an egg. <laughs> I have egg spin. <laughs> I have the stuff of egg, and, and it's, and it's a subtle vibration, and it gives me a sense of warmth. And I know that sounds funny out here, but I feel <laughs> that I contain limitlessness, and, 
And that sounds funny out here, too. <laughs> Egg spin, huh? Mm -hmm. Doesn't do a thing for me. <laughs> I could be the start of something. There's that something word again. You're less than nothing, remember? What did you say? Did you say remember? So what? Uh, well, that implies before, earlier.
been nanoseconds and I forgot something already. What? Look, I like you and all, and you're great. You'll always be uh, a special friend with a warm place in my heart, but I will never sleep with Shut you. Shut up! Don't even give that thought life. Fine. You're not the only opposite out there. There are jillions. Jillions and jillions. In this, this <laughs> utterly empty blackness of empty billboards as far as, the, hey, you're special. Oh, right. It's Saturday night and every other egg spin is light years away. <laughs> no, you really are. Listen, you're not, well, you're not my type. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm a force of nature. Oh. Somebody to be reckoned with. Are you now? Not to boast, but I started the Big Bang. <laughs> that was you. Well, not the concept, perhaps, but I helped get it off the ground. <laughs> I don't believe you. I did. I remembered something, and that started time, and one thing led to another. Wait a minute. I do remember you. You are that creep from before. Get away from me! That's <laughs> oh, just where you think you're going. Every other sperm spin is out of here. Expanding universe, they say, over their shoulders as they leave you. But I call it commitment phobia. And I'm right here, available. You know something? That egg spin looks like it's slowing down. Really? I look older. Tick, tock, oh my. Tick, tock, <laughs> oh tick, tock, my. Why? Can it be happening? You know, when the blackness hits you a certain way, you're really quite beautiful. You think so? Oh, yes. Like, like Nance's ass beautiful? <laughs> Nothing less. Magic fingers. Oh, and, and extra space one. So, so unless 
you're really handy with a backhoe and a tool belt, you might as well start sending over your paychecks, Buster, and I will find someone with real sperm skin to do it. What are you doing? Nothing. Are you trying to split? Do you really want out? We rushed into this thing. Well, I need you to split the eye. The pluses and minuses. You were my first. They voided out. Wait! <laughs> Don't you remember when it was all so exciting and time stood still for us? I gotta be going. <laughs> Personal space. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no. We, we split. Maybe, maybe I, I have, have feelings, feelings. <laughs> now, 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 now. <laughs> Speak to me. 
Yeah. 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 Okay, look, I want you to look at this from the jury's perspective, okay? You were out shopping that day, right? Right, for a new pair of pajamas. Um, let's make that a gift for your elderly mother. Okay, so you were outside the store. J.C. Penny. J.C. Penny, right, and you were uh, on your way to the subway. Were you rushing? No, I was taking my time. Good girl, you were careful. You were just minding your own business outside J.C. Penny on the street. Taking your time, minding your own business when bam! You fall in a hole in the sidewalk, and then what happened? Well, it really wasn't a hole. It was more like an indentation. <laughs> Believe me, it was a hole. Then what? Well, I broke my leg. Precisely. You broke your leg. How bad? Oh, very bad. In three places. Oh, oh, that's terrible. Three breaks in a formerly healthy leg. I mean, you could be perfectly crippled. Deformed, certainly. Deformed? <laughs> could be. This is upsetting. Uh, anyway, here's the thing. You've got to tell the jury what you've endured since the accident, the sleepless nights, the swelling, the bruising, the pain that just won't go away. Remember, Miss Beasley, only you can tell the jury how bad you feel. Only you. True. Only me. Fine. So what do you say? On a scale of zero to ten, how bad is your pain today? Five and three quarters. What? That can't be. Look, five and three quarters, it's a half an eighty number, don't you think? Oh, it's okay. It's just a number. I'm trying to be accurate. You're probably in so much pain you don't even realize how much pain you're in. Well, maybe. Besides, this these five and three quarters. It's it's not all those fractions. You can't expect a jury, a jury to do fractions. I mean, this is New York. These people, they'll be counting on your fingers trying to figure it out. Well, I guess. So, um, I have another idea. Round it up. Round it up? What do you mean? Round up five and three quarters to a number that the jury can get. Round it up to, say, nine. Nine? No good? Then take this! There it is!
tax their imagination. Oh, I see, maybe. Yeah, you'll make them feel inadequate. Oh, I guess you may have a point. Sure I do. So? I'll think about it. Good. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. My whiplash should be here any minute. Oh, no, 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 no. no, no we can't go. We can't go. We have one other thing to do, and we can do this quick. Do what? Practice your walk. What's the practice? I hobble a little. That's the problem. A little. We need a lot. <laughs> if you go to the witness stand, the jury will be watching you with eagle eyes. They'll be watching your every move. So you have to well. Uh, Lumber like, like this. You mean pretend it's worse than it is? Pretend is not a word I would use. More like uh, accentuate. Here, not here. Not here. Not here. Not here. Not here. You try. Okay, let me see you do this. Let me see you do this now. Okay. Uh, okay. No, no. No, wait. Move back. Move back. Whoa. No, get out of my way. Why not? I think I know the perfect law. 